about some things that are going on in the market today <clears throat> as it relates to Office 365 uh, particularly. Well, there's 75% uh, of U.S. businesses say they are more productive after adopting Microsoft 365. And the majority of Office 365 customers are small businesses, just like the ones that we serve with less than 50 clients. And the industry with the biggest and highest rate of Office 365 usage is happens to be financial and followed uh, right behind with manufacturing. So, uh, Chidera, Talk to me a little bit about just what you're seeing as far as the trend in Microsoft Office 365 adoption. And let me start off by being transparent. And really, I think for a long time, I was, um, you know, I kind of had the mindset of Office 365 as being just the products that you have on your desktop and email. So, Tell me a little bit about what you've seen over, you know, as, as people are more migrating uh, to Office 365. Certainly, Phil, and uh, you are definitely not alone in thinking, or rather in having that sort of a previous uh, thinking about Office 365 really just being a combination of productivity uh, items such as Word and Excel and PowerPoint. Uh, these days, Microsoft goes so far beyond that, uh, especially through Microsoft 365 Suite, uh, which really is a combination of not only your productivity items, but also your enterprise mobility and security suite. And in addition to that, your Windows 10 licensing. Uh, so your Windows 10 professional and enterprise grade licensing, depending on which uh, a level or tier of Microsoft 365 licensing you choose. Uh, and when you look at it that way, it really makes sense that a, a lot of businesses, especially the uh, small to medium sized businesses are seeing uh, great benefit from Microsoft 365 products because in many ways it covers uh, a majority of their needs, whether it be on the productivity side, whether it be on the security and compliance side of things with EMS, uh, or whether it just be with licensing their workstations with Windows 10 licensing and uh, keeping that uh, regularly up to date. Uh, so these numbers that you're presenting here make uh, complete sense. And as far as the industries that we're seeing with the highest rate of uh, adoption of Office 365 with the financial and manufacturing sector, uh, that also makes sense. Uh, financial, really, because you have a, a lot of great financial tools such as uh, Excel and Access uh, database application. And then on the manufacturing side of things, you have licensing that's tiered towards the uh, typical frontline users or frontline workers uh, that you would see in the manufacturing sector, such as the Microsoft 365 F1 and F3 licensing, uh, which caters towards the uh, the needs of users who are typically working remotely, uh, you know, working away from the office. Uh, they don't need as much access to email as your standard office worker. Uh, and so uh, certain items have been sort of uh, taken out and replaced with uh, features that they can actually leverage while on site. Great. I want to do a quick poll and um, I want to, um, this one, the simple question is, are you using Microsoft Office 365? And I'll keep this open for just a second. We'll let some people jump in and uh, then we'll present the results to kind of see, you know, of the folks here, uh, you know, how many folks are using and how many folks are not. So we'll let this- I'm just gonna have to go ahead and select yes on that. <laughs> All right, we got a few more coming in. We got uh, probably at 71% have voted. I'll keep it open for just a couple seconds more because I'm curious to uh, to see, you know, where uh, folks are in their adoption in our you know our particular market. And it's looking like it is uh, showing up the way I would suspect. So we're going to go ahead and that's a minute. So we'll end it. Uh, I'm going to share the results. And um, so we're seeing here that 64% of folks um, 
are using uh, Microsoft 365. I had a bunch of people not vote, so y'all would uh, next time, you know, let's get you guys voting. But so we're seeing a 65-35 split on people that are using Microsoft Office 365. So, uh, you know, I think that's that's uh, pretty interesting and, and really, in my view, maybe a little higher than I would have expected for this market. All right. So, um, let's go ahead and we're going to, we'll move on with, um, you know, kind of on to with the presentation here. One of the big things that we see and in, in business in general is the, uh, the, you know, the need for communication. You know, if you, if you really got down to, you know, companies failing, projects failing, tasks failing, whatever. It's usually I didn't have the time first and then I didn't communicate with the rest of the people about what I needed or, or, or whatever. So communication is a uh, huge uh, component of business. And of course, if we scale a company, you know, every time we add an additional employee, we add an exponential factor of communication. So that's a major component. And of course, with uh, COVID-19, a lot of people working from home, we're seeing this communication piece uh, becoming a little bit more challenged. So let's talk a little bit about how the Office 365 suite can help with communication. You'll weigh in there for me and tell me your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, Phil. So, you know, talking about communication, really what we're seeing is a massive shift of our users, of our, um, you know, the users that we service, the end users, that is, uh, shifting towards Microsoft Teams as their primary communication platform. Uh, and the reason really comes down to the fact that you can find many of the Office 365 tools that you use on a daily basis uh, being integrated into Microsoft Teams. Uh, so things like your calendar, your OneNote for taking notes, uh, Microsoft Forms, uh, Planner for, you know, having sort of like a, a minimalist project management uh, tool, uh, tasks for keeping track of things that you need to accomplish throughout the day. And, you know, many other services are all sort of being brought into Microsoft Teams, uh, which is really making it a sort of one-stop shop for everything related to communication and collaboration. And then in addition to that, what Microsoft Teams really allows you to do is to leverage active, uh, active and passive forms of communication, whether it be the active form of chatting with one of your team members or another member in your organization, or perhaps even a individual from an organization that's external to your own. It makes that very seamless, uh, very quick forms of communication Whereas, you know, the sort of traditional method of communication being to send an email, uh, waiting, you know, whoever knows how long, several hours, sometimes even a whole business day for a response to your email, uh, because really people feel bogged down by emails. You know, the time that it takes to read through a lengthy email uh, is much longer than it takes to, uh, you know, send a quick chat uh, that drives straight to the point of, you know, what you might be looking to uh, communicate to that recipient. And then in terms of passive forms of communication within Teams, uh, you're able to set status indications, uh, thereby identifying to uh, anyone who might be looking to communicate with you um, where you are in terms of your availability. You know, perhaps you're looking to uh, get some crunch done, you need some focus hours just to yourself so you can go in and let people know that you're busy for a certain duration of time, or maybe you just wanna step away from the uh, desk, especially with remote workers uh, being that we're not all in the office these days, at least. We can't all just, you know, perhaps look over or peer over our cubicles to see who is available and who isn't. Uh, it really goes a long way to uh, helping us sort of understand where our coworkers are uh, in terms of their availability when we can see that passive form of communication in Teams. Yeah. Yeah. Here's just an example I have here as far as, uh, you know, morning huddles. They've, you know, determined that, you know, a quick 15 minute huddle. Uh, amongst a team can be very productive so that you know where everyone is, what they're working on, and it keeps that bond of team and cohesiveness. And, you know, like you had said, uh, you know, whenever you are working from home, having those channels open and being able to hit the do not disturb or, mm -hmm. you know, likewise uh, that you're available and, um, you know, having that kind of a, um, 
you know, a, a, you know, the availability right there at the drop of a hat. And I do like, I tell my team all the time, I'm like, you know, if you want me to respond during the day, I'm out of the office a lot. And yeah. if you want me to respond during the day, don't send me a tomb. You know, these folks that like, and I'm in the technical world and they like, you know, plain text and they don't like mm -hmm. bullet points or anything like that. And then they'll just yeah. make this big blob of all the text. <laughs> Man, it is brutal. I would rather them just, you know, hit me up with a, with a little burst of information that, you know, what I need to know. And I think as a rule, most people are that way. We are much better at skimming than we are at, at having to, you know, we see that as a task or a chore and we're mm -hmm. going to wait till the end of business. So it helps us to improve our effectiveness and our efficiency. Agreed. Definitely. Another thing I'd like you to weigh in on is, um, you know, the training aspect and being able to use record and, um, you know, even being able to search that recording uh, for keywords. If you, you know, speak to me about how you've seen that uh, help businesses. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, beyond just ourselves, we've seen other businesses also leveraging uh, the ability to conduct uh, sort of that one to many presentation uh, using features like uh, Teams live present uh, presentation, uh, where you're able to, uh, much in the same fashion as what we're doing right now, uh, present to uh, several uh, recipients of a particular uh, message or a particular training that you might want to conduct. And in addition to that, while the live presentation is going on, uh, you are able to also record that presentation and have that uh, siphon, siphon off to Microsoft Stream, uh, which is a platform that actually um, allows you to not only upload videos of your own to then distribute amongst your uh, employees or your coworkers in your organization. But in addition to that, it acts as the backbone for Microsoft's uh, recordings so that when you need to go and uh, you know peruse or sift through that recording, you're able to do so within Microsoft Teams. And you are able to search for keywords as well. So there is quite a bit of intelligence built into uh, the recordings themselves when conducted in Microsoft Teams, which makes it a lot easier uh, for individuals who might be looking for specific information within recording, you know, something that is maybe key or instrumental to their uh, particular role at the company, and they just want to jump to that and uh, see that as quickly as possible. And then uh, in addition to that, with the uh, recordings for Microsoft Teams, uh, you're also able to add the uh, closed captioning as well. So that's uh, very uh, instrumental as far as accessibility goes for uh, different users. Yeah, and different environments such as marketing, if you wanted to pass something out and it would, uh, you know, put all the text at the bottom because, you know, more and more people are in environments where they could read and watch something and read it, but they didn't want to have their audio on per se. So I think yeah. that, um, again, um, this product has so many what we call hidden gems in it that uh, are just, you know, they're able to bundle it and it just begins to make more and more uh you know, sense. One of the things that um, that we see, and we really we call them got a minutes, um, and you know, having um, you know going to someone's office or or stopping their production in order to have what we call a got a minute meeting. That's a whole nother topic uh, that I could spend some time on. That we really try to drive down with within our organization. Um, because those uh, meetings, oftentimes, you know, you're talking about work, but you're not identifying the issue, discussing the issue in a way, and assigning responsibilities to the solution of the business. We call that IDS, and those got a minute minutes will uh, suck the life out of your energy. So this is another thing that uh, you know really is uh, is you know, fundamental with a, with a, a product, let's say like teams. Another thing is, you know, being able to access uh, products while you're on the go. And one of the things that impresses me the most are about the Office 365 platform is that, you know, you can have it on five devices with one license and everything that you did on one spot is, is everywhere. Like a pick up my phone and I can I can look at my most recent Word documents that I've been working on or, or, or my iPad or my home computer. Uh, you know, that is so critical uh, to not have to search for things. So um, I think I'll leave that, you know, again, all these 
products work across multiple platforms, uh, Microsoft, Android, iOS. Mm -hmm. uh, did I miss anything there? Uh, I think that's not all oh, Mac OS, but yeah, I'm sure people figure that out as well if it works on iOS. <laughs> but yeah, sure. uh, basically every, uh, and then, you know, for those who happen to use Linux, it, it does work there as well. So um, pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah. We have, we have a few people who use Linux here. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, Microsoft has always been the 800 pound gorilla in the room, and now there may be up to 1200 pounds. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're really, they're really bundling this stuff in a way that is, is, you know, it's, it's really, it's, uh, it's, it's working well. Talk to me a little bit about how you can use recognition channel. You know, I call it like gamification. We try to do that a, a, a lot around here, uh, you know, trying to, you know, highlight somebody or maybe even uh, put environments together where we could do competitions. Talk to me how we could use Office 365 to do that. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, one way in which we use uh, Office 365, especially Microsoft Teams, to uh, recognize employees that really are going above and beyond and excelling in their uh, in their field or task uh, is through the praise feature, uh, where you can actually uh, give praise to uh, your coworker uh, for you know doing something that you found to be particularly uh, exceptional, and it's something that we frequently do to again just really show each other how much we appreciate the work that we're doing, you know, and how much uh, their efforts to assist us in various tasks uh, means a lot to us. Uh, so in terms of uh, providing recognition within uh, the Office 365 suite, uh, it's a great way of doing it. Yeah. And then, you know, of course, like collaboration and being able to, um, you know, all work together, kind of talking, you know, kind of furthering that, uh, you know, that which we're talking about and how we recognize people, but really, mm -hmm. you know, being able to work together. Let's talk about how we share uh, a particular product, uh, you know, a, a particular application or something we're working on within, you know, and this can be, I guess, on, on anything, right? Word, yeah. Excel, PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yes. Uh, so uh, throughout the various platforms at Microsoft or Office 365 is available, uh, you do have different means of sharing. And really, uh, one of the easiest means of sharing is to produce a URL link uh, that you can then provide to anyone. And uh, with that link, the recipient is then able to access the file that you're sharing, whether it be through your OneDrive for business or uh, it be through SharePoint, uh, for instance. Now, in terms of sharing, uh, especially with a focus on security, uh, that is definitely something uh, Microsoft 365 administrators should keep in mind or bear in mind. Uh, you are able to uh, lock down the different parameters as far as sharing of uh, company data is concerned. And it's certainly something that you wanna look through uh, as far as SharePoint online is concerned, uh, just to make sure that you are uh, firstly adhering to you know, whatever compliance requirements your organization is subjected to. And then of course, ensuring that uh, uh, company IP or intellectual property is not being uh, mistakenly or accidentally sent out and perhaps left out there in the wild. Uh, so some capabilities that you are able to configure are things like uh, expiration times for share links. So that when a link is shared after a certain duration of time that you specified as an administrator, uh, that link would then expire. Uh, but even as an end user, uh, you do have the capability to, uh, you know, sort of determine, you know, how long you want that link to be available to, or uh, whether you want to send that link uh, via email directly and you only want the email recipients to be able to open up the link that you provided. Or again, if you just want anyone to have access to that link, or perhaps you only want people within your organization to be able to access uh, whatever is behind that shared link. These are all things that you're able to configure at the time of creating the share uh, yeah. link or the share option. Yeah, that. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more a little later about, you know, security and DLP, which is, you know, data loss prevention and, mm -hmm. um, you know, all those types of topics, which are extremely relevant. Like, you know, really That's what hard. I feel like I do as a, as a company, what we do as a company is we want to provide effective and efficient means to use technology. But of course, you have to throw in security because uh, our data is extremely valuable. Talk to me about creating a, a private channel and maybe some of the uh, applications for a, you know, a business owner to use a private channel. 
Yes, definitely. So in terms of creating a, pr a private channel, what you uh, what you do there is really specify that no one can join the channel unless they are uh, explicitly invited by the owner or one of the owners of, uh, of that channel. And in doing so, uh, you sort of better segment, uh, you know, your workforce in a way such that they are able to focus on a particular task. Let's say there is a channel that is specific to completing one task. You don't want, you know, any, uh, uh, any employees or any users who are not working on that same task to join in on that channel. Uh, it really helps to just sort of narrow down that focus for private channels. And also there's, uh, you know, the potential of maybe some, uh, some confidential information being shared, shared within that channel. Well, you wanna ensure that the right eyes and only the right eyes are uh, viewing that information within that private channel. So that's a great way of going about it. Yeah, and that, you know, for us, we use, we have several different channels because, you know, uh, you may wanna talk with one person, you may wanna talk with a team, Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a quick way to simply have that little group built. You click on it, you can send a message out to the entire group, and you're not interrupting you know, other people then um, then that, that don't need to be interrupted. And sure. I think there's a lot of effectiveness and efficiency that is is driven from that, almost like the way that we would, um, you know, we also do VoIP phone systems. And one of the things that I'm always trying to, uh, you know, talk, you know, really small businesses out of is they want every phone in the in the building to ring a lot of times yeah. whenever <laughs> a call comes in and just the overall, uh, you know, they're, of course, they don't want to miss a call, which is extremely important, but there's a lot of other ways and that interruption uh, cost your company an enormous amount of money uh, and, you know, trying to, you know, bring that kind of a, you know, an intangible to, to, you know, quantify that is sometimes difficult, but it's very important. Talk yeah, about um, how we're doing, you know, like collaboration, especially when doing something remotely uh, mm -hmm. using tools. Uh, give us some examples of how people are co-authoring uh, mm -hmm. and making edits in real time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one way in which our organization uh, really leverages the ability to uh, co-author and collaborate within uh, applications like uh, Microsoft Word and Excel uh, is for the sake of uh, working on a document together. Uh, so I'll give you an example, a recent example. Uh, myself and one of my colleagues recently worked on a uh, script for a little video meetup that we had not too long ago. And with the co-authoring feature within uh, Microsoft Word, uh, we were able to comment out, uh, you know, possible changes that we'd like to make. And then uh, that would leave it up to, uh, you know, one of us to uh, accept that comment or accept that change. So you are able to, uh, you know, suggest changes without actually impacting the, uh, the document itself, or you could possibly um, make the change directly in the document if that's something that uh, the two of you agree, have agreed upon. But then the owner of the document, the creator of the document is able to set the uh, level or the, uh, the threshold for uh, edits to be made uh, so that you can, you know, ensure that, hey, I don't want anyone making any direct changes to the document, but I would like to get some, you know, comments about certain uh, parts of the document, some uh, possible edits that I can make. Uh, you can, of course, uh, configure the permissions to allow only uh, uh, people to read it, but not make any changes as well, uh, much in the same fashion as you would when protecting a Word document prior to you sharing it out. Yeah, of course, it keeps all the version, um, the versioning so that you can see and you can actually go back and restore it from a previous version and all of that, which is so powerful. And, you know, what I find even like when I'm doing training with with staff, a lot mm -hmm. of times I find it, you know, they need to almost uh, be at their computer, you know, at a comfortable environment rather than, you know, you do a training where you're, you know, on top of each other and, you know, only <laughs> one person's uh, doing, I find that doing, doing training or collaboration like this is, is really easily done. Uh, and it doesn't have to be done in real time. You can just share the document and when they have a moment, they can work on it. They can make edits, they can make notes, you can track all of that. And it's just really a very effective way in order to, uh, you know, to get things done. And, um, and then also, 
if you ever had to go back and review, no, I know we did that. I know I, I agreed to that. Well, you have a history right here that can say, you know, how it all sure. went down. Yes, yes. So I want to, you know, transition a little bit about some productivity hacks because at the end of the day, you know, technology is not worth, you know, worth, uh, you know, there's no value in it unless it provides some way to uh, make life easier, increase revenue, increase security. You know, there's got to be a why uh, in order to, you know, to make something valuable. So let's talk about some top productivity hacks that you, uh, you know, that you are aware of inside of uh, that, uh, the focus on your inbox and, and Outlook. What is that for? Yeah, so the, uh, the focus uh, inbox within Outlook really allows you to uh, narrow down the types of emails that you want presented to you initially when you review your inbox. And this is all sort of intelligently mapped out by uh, Office 365 or Exchange Online in the background. And it's based on uh, sort of uh, uh, interpreting the types of emails that you typically pay attention to, the types of recipients that you typically open emails from and respond to, and then using that telemetry across uh, across the board within Outlook, uh, it's then able to uh, make sure that you are really seeing the information that's most relevant to you. And then that little other section that's right next to the focus inbox, uh, it, you can kind of think of it as like your spam light folder. It's not necessarily spam, but really just emails that you uh, have typically not responded to in the past or shown any interest in. Uh, so you are, of course, able to look in there if you're, for some reason, not finding an email that you're expecting within your focus inbox. And uh, from there, uh, you know, perhaps decide for yourself if you'd like that to be included in your focus inbox. Yep. So and it's basically just a way to, and again, the one of the biggest drivers in technology today is artificial intelligence. So yeah. this is actually being crafted based upon your specific habits. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so it really makes it as you use the product, uh, the longer you use it, the better it gets. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, let's talk about turning on auto save. You know, mm-hmm. how, uh, you know, how's that work? Yeah. Uh, firstly, I think it's something that everyone should absolutely be using. It's saved me so many times from, you know, my laptop running on a battery and I wasn't paying attention or just random power outages on a desktop or what have you. And really the way it works is that it uses OneDrive uh, or in the uh, business, uh, in the Microsoft 365 business and enterprise license, you know, the OneDrive for business. Uh, and what that does is enables applications such as Word and Excel and PowerPoint to automatically save versions of documents you're working on in real time in uh, OneDrive, so that way that whenever something catastrophic happens, or you know if your application happens to uh, crash on you, uh, you can ensure that whatever that last edit you made was, that would still be uh, preserved, and you can easily access it once more. Uh, typically, just by opening up the application, and then it'll uh, provide you with that last version uh, for the saved documents. Or if you're like me, if all of a sudden you're sitting there and you're right in the middle of something and you have to jump up and just leave, mm-hmm. you know, then you can go home and you can open up that in your OneDrive and it saves yes. exactly where the moment that you left so that right. you can pick right back up and start working and, and uh, continue on right where you left off, which I think is, uh, is really cool. So it's not only like a disaster recovery kind of thing, but it's also a productivity thing so that you're not having to, oh, did I click save on that? whatever (laughs) yes yes definitely and then uh, one caveat to that though is that the document does need to be saved within OneDrive uh, prior to you being able to enable autosave but that's something that you'll see even as you attempt to enable that feature you'll be prompted to uh, resave that document within OneDrive before enabling yeah and speaking of just while we're here on OneDrive I don't think it's in the slide deck, but also being able to do backups of your My Documents, My Desktop. That's a, that's oh, a yes. setting and a feature that needs to be turned on within OneDrive so that in the event that you did lose a hard drive on the laptop while working from home, or mm-hmm. if you did just need to have that data to know that it's backed up, it's a quick, easy way to do that. Definitely. But, it's also a great way of uh, a great form of ransomware protection as well. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so... Um, let's talk about, you know, recalling a sent, um, 
unread email like, oh God, I hit send. I wish I wouldn't have sent that. Um, how does that work? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the thing about recalling sent emails, it's it's rather kind of finicky um, function within uh, within Outlook. Uh, you are often able to do it if you recall the email uh, quickly enough or enact the recall feature quickly after you send in the email. But it does. I would say I've run into issues, plenty of issues within the past, and I prefer not to rely on that feature if at all possible. But, you know, if, if that's something that absolutely needs to be done, especially if it's within the company's domain. Uh, so if you're sending it within uh, your own organization's uh, 0365 tenant, for instance, uh, it does become a more reliable feature. Yeah, that's right. This is something that, you know, I've had people call me literally and they're like, oh, my God, you know, I think they you know, maybe were emotional. And can you do it? Mm -hmm. So there's some caveats to this. It's got to be Definitely. with their own organization it has to be before they read it. So it's there, but it's uh, it's not uh, foolproof and it certainly won't work for outside organizations because once that leaves the the gun, basically, mm -hmm. you can't put that that bullet back in the gun. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so think before you send. Uh, so that would be my uh, recommendation. How do you play your emails? Yeah. So um, as far as playing emails goes, that's actually used in Cortana uh, to play back your emails for you. And in fact, speaking of which, that's a feature that's uh, being adopted with Microsoft Teams as well to uh, read out messages for you. Uh, but in effect, uh, you know, once you've set up Outlook, uh, you can have Cortana uh, read out your emails to you. And then, uh, you know, using just your voice, you're able to, uh, to articulate or rather uh, you're able to uh, draft emails that can then be uh, sent back to that uh, sender. Yeah. And it even works like it'll integrate with... Um... It integrates with your calendar so that if it was to pertain to things about us rescheduling of meetings, there's that artificial intelligent element that is trying to, you know, uh, help you by saying, hey, you may want to look at this on your calendar. So yeah. uh, something I honestly have not used that, but uh, it seems, um, you know, again, as the world goes forward and this artificial intelligence gets more and more um more and more informed about how we act and what we do, I can see that product really getting stronger and stronger. Well, definitely. And then in terms of accessibility as well, you know, for, um, you know, uh, employees or users who might have difficulty reading uh, the email for one reason or another, it really does help to have that sort of alternative uh, solution in place. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, let's move to the fifth one here about, uh, Creative PowerPoint uh, Morph and Designer. How is that working? Yeah, so what that's really doing is helping you as a uh, creator to be able to uh, easily find or really have have Microsoft <laughs> easily find uh, presentation templates and you know stylings that suits your style of presentation. It's actually something I've used quite often because I am not a creative person. Uh, <laughs> so it, it helps to be able to kind of rely on Microsoft to uh, quote unquote beautify my presentation for me. And again, probably using some form of artificial intelligence to, uh, to determine, you know, what best fits in the situation. It's going to get smarter and stronger as time goes on. And it's going to make your presentations, you know, look a lot smoother and, mm -hmm. and really probably a lot more advanced than, uh, you know, than the, than the guy with the jackhammer saying uh, under construction. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. Beyond that, beyond yeah. the parts. <laughs> It's going to, yeah, it's going to do things about adding more images and, you know, working out those transactions and, you know, shadings and really just, it's got some, again, intelligence on how that works. That's really cool. I haven't used that. That would be something Christy would use. And uh, I'm, I'm very curious to see uh, that kind of, you know, make that uh, PowerPoint product become more of a, a robust uh 
tool that, you know, that people are spending a lot of money on. Again, Microsoft is now the 1200 pound gorilla and they're, they're making their already products that are widely used become more powerful. It's probably going to squeeze out the Adobe's of the world in some, in some environments. Very true. <laughs> so we're looking at, um, you know, that resume reading feature within, uh, I guess, is that in, in word only? So the resume reading feature, I, I, I personally have not used it myself, but I do believe it is currently only available in Word, but that's not to say that it won't at some point make its way to other Office 365 applications. I mean, the way Microsoft operates, it typically uh, release it on a smaller scale, see how the uh, user adoption goes, and then from there decide what other, uh, what other applications would they like to include that in. Yeah, so that's something where basically it would remind you, welcome back, here we go, um, you know, take off. So that's kind of a neat thing that uh, is a feature that's in there. Um, let's talk about this product, OneNote. It's something that I fell in love with early on. Yes. I actually had about a one-minute uh, training with a guy sitting next to me at a conference because he was keeping notes in it. And he gave me like a one minute training and I used it for that conference to take notes and then boom, now I have tons of one notes uh, and I use it uh, exclusively. I think it's one of those products that's kind of been thrown into the, you know, the, the suite and most people don't use it. Let's talk about how you see people using it to improve their productivity. Yeah, firstly, I'll say, you know, everyone uh, at this organization uses uh, Microsoft OneNote and myself included, I use it on a daily basis. It's really, really the main note taking uh, application I use. And in fact, uh, Microsoft took a lot of what they learned from our Evernote and uh, implement, implemented that into OneNote. Uh, so you're constantly seeing features that were in Evernote being introduced into OneNote as well. Um, some features that I particularly like are is the ability, well, firstly, the fact that OneNote auto saves uh, because OneNote itself is being backed up by OneDrive. So whenever you create or draft a note, uh, you can be sure that whatever you typed out will be saved uh, and you don't need to worry about clicking on save or anything along those lines. Uh, second to that is the ability to uh, really structure your notes in a way that makes it more easily legible to yourself or perhaps anyone that you want to share the OneNote with. Uh, you're able to create tabs within OneNote. The tabs, you can really think of them as sort of chapters within your notebook. Uh, and then with the chapters, you're able to then create sections in that OneNote. So you can kind of think of it as a way of organizing the different chapters within the OneNote. Uh, with those sections, you're able to create structured um, sort of uh, tiering. So let's say I have, well, let me give you an example of how I would have my OneNote structured. So what I will typically do is assign a date. So let's say um, July 28th, 2020. And I want to go ahead and document essentially everything that occurred while at work uh, in that section. Well, then I'll create a subcategory and uh, title that. And then by right clicking on that section, I'm then able to select make this a sub page or a make sub page, which will then demote the page and give it that sort of tiered look to it. And then by doing that, I'm also able to uh, contract and expand the parent section. So that way it makes uh, everything just more organized and easier for me to read through. Uh, and then as far as uh, additional features within OneNote, uh, you're able to add to do tags to your notes. So let's say there's something in particular that you want to remember to get to, or maybe a checklist, perhaps a grocery list, and you want to just be able to, you know, carry around your phone with the OneNote app open and, you know, check things off as you complete them. That is a great feature to have uh, handy as well. And then I could go on and on about this. Let me the drop a couple. Drop feature. I wanna, <laughs> yeah, I want to drop a couple how I use it because I'm such a fan. Uh, like I like templates with that, oh, like okay. that little checkbox. I will yeah. build out particular templates for certain things that I'm going to do. Say it's a sales engagement. I want to make sure that I hit certain topics. And what's so cool about it is that I can go back and modify the template so that every time I learn something new that I need to do, I just modify the template. Then I copy that template, just drag it into a new client. So I can nice. go back and look and I do it basically year. Um, 
month client so that I can have is tiered. If I want to go back and look what I did a year ago on a particular month with a particular client, I see it. And, um, That's very and then, good. yeah, so there's just so many and it. To me, I call it like a down and dirty app. It's really easy to learn and it's True. really powerful. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I, I can pick it up on my phone and I can uh, do it. And another thing that I do is like to do's like to do lists. I've played a thousand different games with how to manage a to do list. What I do is I do it by the month and mm, okay. I will do a full month and I'll have a little checkbox with all my to do's and I can add it from my phone or from my computer. And um, I add things and then I cut and paste things that are not done from one month to the next month. And so I just keep a whole month and I have like this running list of things to do. I drag mm-hmm. the, the most priority ones up to the top. I check those off <clears throat> anyway. So I have a way that I actually manage my to do's that I think is pretty cool. So I could really yeah. do a whole training on that product because <laughs> I think it's uh, it's like one of those, you know, a hidden gem It's laying there. Sure nobody is using it. So sure. Uh, in the sake of time, we got to keep moving. Uh, you know, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, scheduling earlier and, um, you know, in this, let's talk about how room finder works. Yeah. Yeah. So room finder really works by, uh, look at the resources that have been made available, excuse me, within your exchange or exchange online. Sorry, losing my voice. Uh, within your uh, exchange or exchange online, uh, environments by your administrators, um, so, for instance, if you have a conference room uh, that needs to be booked out, well, you're able to go ahead and use your Outlook calendar uh, or even your team's calendar to uh, find that particular resource, that room, and then uh, proceed to uh, request a booking. Now, depending on whether or not your administrator has uh, set up a requirement that the, the request be approved, by someone, or if the room itself has been configured to auto accept requests, uh, you can then see your requested uh, time and day uh, selected within the calendar of that particular room. And then if you have access to the room's calendar, uh, which I've seen some organi- organizations do, where they just go ahead and provide everyone access to the different calendars of the room so that they can you know, sort of plan ahead as to what uh, day and time they want to go ahead and schedule, but then you'll be able to cross-reference that for yourself. Yep. It's really a powerful thing. And you think that it's, it's not hard to set up. And, you know, we have it set up to where pretty much anybody can schedule the room as long as it's not scheduled. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're small enough. We can do that. And probably most of our clients are. But yeah. knowing that somebody's got that room, it's nothing worse than, than uh, you know, going and walking in thinking you can, you know, go into the room and it be taken so really a, a pretty cool feature easy to use easy to set up and it'll it'll help uh conflicts from from happening and if there is going to be a conflict it'll alert you to say that there's going to be a conflict before you book so that you can go ahead and get it worked out before the the meeting time very true Let's talk a little bit about capture uh, and save. This is something yeah. you know, kind of new probably for most people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's something I use frequently. I actually use it to capture pictures of receipts, uh, invoices, things like that nature, uh, because I, I just hate keeping paper with me. I always end up losing the receipt anyway, so might as well go ahead and uh, digitize it so that way it's uh, much easier for me to lug around. <laughs> There's no weight to that, right? Um, the way in which I also use uh, the capture feature, uh, as far as Microsoft Lens is concerned, is that uh, as you can see within the uh, the presentation itself, uh, you're able to uh, select where you want to have that capture sent to. Whether you want to go immediately to your gallery, uh, perhaps you want to go ahead and create a PDF out of it, and then from there share the PDF, or do you want to save it to OneNote or OneDrive? I particularly like something that's a OneNote because what you can also leverage within OneNote is the uh, OCR feature, uh, the the optical, uh, uh, the optical capture recognition, something along those lines. Don't quote me. <laughs> but what that effectively does is uh, intelligently scan the picture that you submitted. Look at the words within the picture itself. So as you see in that project schedule, there are words on the left-hand side and in the uh, top column or row rather. And then from there, extract those words and present them to you in just uh, 
in just the written format. So that way you don't have to perhaps retype things. So it really makes it uh, very easy to uh, make images searchable uh, and then also, or rather text in images searchable it makes that very easy uh, or perhaps just construct notes out of a given picture itself. Yep. And it can be done on not just, it can be done on a sign. It can be done off a business card. It can be mm -hmm. done off of a handwritten memo. It can be used really across the board. Like some people like to take notes in the meeting. Uh, that's mm -hmm. just how they, you know, they work. You know, they, they like to write it by hand and you can um, take that, take a picture of it, convert it to text, do OCR on it so you could search it. Uh, and again, drop it in a Word document or OneNote or PDF it or, or really do whatever you want to do with it. And really a very powerful tool that I think uh, could save people a lot of time. And, uh, you know, it just adapts well with, you know, with day-to-day -day work. Very true. Very true. And optical character recognition. That's the word I was like, or the expression I was yeah, looking for. I thought you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> character recognition. That's how, I'm, exactly. that's how I remembered it too. But again, sometimes you can remember one of those uh, acronyms wrong and you'll always say it all the it. time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I yeah. want to correct myself now so I don't keep doing it and I don't mislead anyone else into doing it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what about like uploading changes? You know, say we got a picture here of a guy working on the beach. He doesn't even have internet connection. Mm -hmm. um, how, how is that going to work? Yeah, so the great thing about OneDrive is that you can always save to it. The OneDrive um, uh, application itself is presented to you, the end user, as a folder uh, within, your, within your file explorer. Uh, you can either save directly to there or you can save it to one of the uh, folders that have been synced with OneDrive. So perhaps your desktop folder, uh, your documents folder. And then what will occur is that the moment you regain internet access, whatever you save to that OneDrive or those OneDrive sync folders will then begin syncing back uh, up to Microsoft servers. And then from there, they'll become accessible on uh, any uh, device that happens to have uh, internet access. Yeah, and that's huge because you know you don't wanna you know, have documents at risk mm -hmm. and you also wanna be able to collaborate with your team because that could be a shared document that's once you get to the internet, it's gonna sync and your other folks can see it or it could be uh, you know something that you want to pick up and work up work off of. So that's already um, you know it's already you know been in place, but it's something that um, you know working offline. Uh, you know it doesn't. You don't have to be connected to the internet. You can mm -hmm. you can make it work. For sure. Uh, customized mobile swipe options. This is something that is um, you know something that's a little new. I would say to most people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'd say so. So tell me about how you see, um, you know, how do you see that working uh, for folks? Yeah, so the way I see it working for folks would be for those who feel more comfortable with a certain swipe pattern, um, what they can then do is to, you know, perhaps go ahead and open up the Outlook mobile app settings or the settings within their Outlook mobile app. And then from there, assign, you know, what type of swipe function they want or what type of action they want to occur uh, depending on the way they swipe. Perhaps they want, uh, you know, swiping right to delete emails, for example, uh, then that's something that they can go ahead and do. Or perhaps they want to have swiping left uh, more the email as read or unread. That's also something that they, they can go ahead and, and do as well. Uh, I apologize if there's any background noise. We're actually having uh, some windows being installed. Uh, please let me know if that gets you too much. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is going to be more specific to Microsoft um, on your mobile phone, Microsoft Outlook on your mobile phone. And, and, you know, really, I think a lot of people are using, uh, like on their mobile phone, they're not using Outlook, they're using whatever, um, you know, email application comes with your phone. And I tell you, once you move over, if you're used to Outlook on your uh, desktop and you move to Outlook on your mobile device, it really is so much more powerful and so much better. And sure. it's like a dating app. You can swipe left <laughs> if you want to keep it or you can swipe right if you want to delete it. So uh, really pretty cool. Our market red or, or whatever, our market unread is the way I like mine is because, you know, that's a, a means by which I 
it's like I'll leave it unread, you know, I'll read it and then I'll mark it unread as that means I got to deal with it later. So a lot of ways that, uh, you know, that you can gain some, uh, you know, some effectiveness. Uh, let's talk about ways that we can ignore and declutter emails. Today, you know, emails become less of a platform because of, um, you know, from a marketing perspective and things like that, because people get so many emails. I don't have the stat in front of me, but <clears throat> I think the average person gets like 150 emails a day or something. It's something crazy like that. And, you know, that takes time. So how can we use Office 365 to ignore and declutter some of our emails? Yeah, definitely. So the way in which you can go ahead and use Office 365 to, uh, to ignore uh, emails is through uh, the Outlook settings. Uh, naturally. <laughs> so what you can actually do is to, uh, you know, configure Outlook to uh, automatically move messages uh, you no, no longer want or that you're no longer working on uh, outside of your Outlook inbox. So that way, again, you have that sort of focus view on your inbox uh, being presented with only pertinent emails that you feel the need that to still respond to, uh, somewhat akin to, uh, as uh, Phil said earlier, marking emails as unread again. Uh, this is another means by which you can uh, ensure that you are staying on track and that you respond back to the emails that need to be responded to while moving the emails that no longer are relevant outside of your purview. Yeah, and just really a lot of different ways that you can set up rules to automatically make things go into uh, into folders. That's another yeah. you know, powerful way of... Um, you know, I have a lot of rules set up in my inbox so that if a particular word in the subject line or a particular sender, it automatically routes to a particular folder because especially if you're a mobile person, you don't want that showing up in your inbox. You, you may want it and you may need to deal with it, but you don't want to deal with it by, you know, while you're on the uh, on the road or, you know, off a mobile phone. So a lot of other things like ignore uh, is another feature that is, uh, you know, powerful uh, in helping you, uh, you know, clean up and then, you know, just there's a, a managed clutter and, you know, there's just a lot of features in there that uh, are very, very, very uh, powerful. And the so, next one here, go ahead. Do you have something else? Oh, no, I was just saying, absolutely. I actually also structure my folders in the same way with rules. So, you know, perhaps I, have a particular client that I want uh, emails coming from uh, that client based on their domain name to always go into. Uh, it's a great way uh, to keep things clean in your inbox and sort of have that zero read or zero unread <laughs> emails. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, that's kind of, you know, I use mine. I have an AAA actionable folder that I'll drag things into and I leave them unread in there. It's just a, a down and dirty way of, of keeping up with what I need to be doing that, you know, from an email perspective, uh, if it's, you know, unread in the AAA actionable, that means I've got to, you know, I've got to deal with it because I want my inbox to be all read. I don't want any yeah. unread messages in there. So yeah. those are just some, some tactics or tips. Um, yeah. We talked about this a little bit earlier about OneNote, uh, like those to-do lists. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I love, love, love checking that checkbox, uh, like that little square <laughs> box you see on the screen. You can yeah. click it and it puts a little checkbox in it. Um, and uh, again, it will sync so that I can touch it on my phone and all that other uh, good kind of things. Um, I think we kind of, we discussed that. Um, you know, talking about, you know, translation uh, from language to language, that's something that, you know, I currently, I don't have to do, but uh, it has those features within the, uh, the 365 platform, right? That's true. Uh, very true. So, uh, again, uh, just, you know, <laughs> harping on more about that accessibility or the accessibility features that Microsoft is uh, building into their uh, 365 applications. Uh, so within Word, uh, you're able to use or leverage your translate feature. Also within OneNote, you're also able to translate uh, your notes uh, if for some reason you, you know, copied and pasted a, uh, a, you know, paragraph in a different language, you can go ahead and have that translated uh, to your preferred language. And then of course, you know, more and more languages are being added. There's actually quite a long list of languages already added. Uh, some of which I am uh, remiss to say that I don't even 
I didn't even know existed. <laughs> so more yeah. languages than I speak, and certainly uh, more languages than I know of, <laughs> and more I, being I believe, added. I believe there's like 60 languages now that are translatable. So, yeah, yeah, definitely a lot. <laughs> Which, you know, I could see people working internationally and uh, mm -hmm. you know, even using that just as a way, although most people that are dealing with Americans, they can read English pretty well. They may use it the other way uh, to true. make life a little easier for them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, as the world gets smaller, you know, I can see that being a, a more and more powerful thing. Certainly, and, and it also helps with that collaboration, uh, that global collaboration as well. Mm -hmm. um, so... This here, to me, whenever you see the power of the Office 365 suite and mm -hmm. having it bundled or, or basically captured into SharePoint is something that, uh, um, you know, I kind of talk to people. I've, I've hired a new chief technology officer, and one of his big strengths is Office 365 and SharePoint. And, you know, what we would have done, you know, years ago for that corporate intranet that would have cost tens of thousands of dollars to develop uh, and really only having a very limited amount of flexibility in what it can deliver um, is, is right there uh, at, at your fingertips with SharePoint. Um, and I, I, to me, as a uh, as an entrepreneur and as a business guy and as a guy that's trying to scale a business, you know, you got to have uniformity. You know, you've got to have processes and documentation and uniformity. I see SharePoint as our next big venture as a company and being able to build out, you know, departmental dashboards for communication and build out the applications that are needed for a particular role. And I just see so much power in this. Um, have you been, um, have you used SharePoint a lot? Definitely. And we also have uh, organizations who use SharePoint as their sole uh, document repository. So uh, SharePoint is something that we see being used greatly, SharePoint Online especially. And then as far as uh, SharePoint, uh, is concerned, you know, it really acts as the backbone to Microsoft Teams, you know, hence security and compliance measures that are implemented in SharePoint do also impact Microsoft Teams as well. And then all files that are shared via Microsoft Teams can be found uh, within their respective SharePoint folder. Uh, so, you know, channels that are created within Teams, uh, they, you know, have a folder of their own within SharePoint that then houses files that are shared within those channels. And then of course, the teams themselves have uh, folders within SharePoint. And that's another thing to consider as well. Whenever you create a Microsoft team, what you're effectively doing is creating a SharePoint folder. And then from there, the different folders that are created or channels that are created within the team uh, become cascading folders within their respective SharePoint folder. Sorry, yeah. same folders a lot. <laughs> but then, yeah. uh, you know, another thing is that uh, SharePoint handles uh, things like version control, as we said earlier, and folder hierarchy, uh, Microsoft Teams really just makes file sharing in SharePoint a more fluid process as well. So as opposed to uh, having users go into the SharePoint folder, you know, open up a web browser, navigate to the respective SharePoint sites, open up the uh, appropriate folder to then access files, you can just have them go into Teams and it just makes things a lot sort of I'd say easier to comprehend and wrap your mind around when it's presented to you in Microsoft Teams. And then the strongest uh, tool I'd say for SharePoint is the Sync Client, which actually allows you to synchronize SharePoint folders to your file explorer. So that way you don't have to always open up your browser to get to those files that you uh, need access to on a regular basis. Yeah, it's it just, and really uh, the world kind of creates itself uh, in one regard, like the work that you're doing is actually putting it all there. It's it's just to me, it is absolutely phenomenal the power that is within that. And Definitely. for any organization that wants standardization, and there's also a lot of features in there that that you can do from a data loss prevention. You know, knowing who has uh, access, who what they have done with files. There's an audit log that's happening uh, behind mm -hmm. the behind the scenes. Uh, again, just something that, um, you know, from a, a SharePoint consultant uh, deal, that's the services that we are going to be offering very, very, very soon. 
and it's something that uh, I'm most excited about. We're going to, of course, you know, we're going to eat our own filet mignon, and we're going to make our own world out, and then we're going to uh, help companies do that. So I'm really excited about that, which kind of lends myself, it, it lends itself to Microsoft and security. If, sure. if you were to ask me, uh, you know, of one of the things, you know, Microsoft does a lot of things. And this is how I like to explain it to people. In the perfect world, you would basically, uh, you would say, all right, turn everything off and then turn on these things in this manner that I need. Uh, but really, in the real world, uh, that would be impossible to manage at a large scale because yeah. there would be so much setup, so much technical support that went into crafting that, that uh, no company, even as large as Microsoft, could do a great job of it. So they wind up turning on things and not turning on audit logs and not doing things from a standpoint that uh, I think uh, is lacking in a relationship with technology. And of course, that's where services, you know, that we come in and help companies with. But I'd like just to hear your take on Microsoft and security. Yeah, definitely, Phil. Uh, and I do agree that uh, unfortunately, Microsoft uh, does not always make the right decision for us. And a lot of times it's up to us as system administrators and consultants to uh, decide really what needs to be implemented based on business needs. Uh, or based on that particular organization's uh, requirements. And as far as security goes, the way I like to see it is that within the past couple of years or within the past, let's say, uh, three to four years, Microsoft has really uh, rebranded themselves as a security company, which is something that's not fully sort of understood or appreciated by a lot of customers these days. Uh, the way they, they think and feel about Microsoft is that, oh yeah, Microsoft, they, they create Word, right? Or they, you know, they have PowerPoint, right? Uh, but it goes so far beyond that. Um, really with Microsoft's uh, somewhat recent acquisition of uh, two security firms, uh, two Israeli security firms, what Microsoft has done is greatly bolster the security practice across the board. Uh, so you have things like the Microsoft Authenticator app uh, for conducting or rather for completing uh, multi-factor authentication challenges. And you have uh, the security that's built into Azure AD to protect all your identities because Azure AD is what houses all the identities that are then used to access all of the Microsoft 365 apps and features within your organization. Uh, those security measures include uh, conditional access policies that can uh, be used to determine whether a user should be permitted access to access one of your Microsoft online services or any of the connected apps that you have uh, configured with single sign-on, uh, or to what extent should that user be permitted access, you know, to that service? You know, what sort of things you want to uh, control as far as that user's uh, authorization is concerned? And then going beyond that, uh, you have things like into mobile device management, uh, or also known as mobile enterprise management, because it manages more than just mobile devices. Uh, it, it can drill down to managing just the specific applications that are pertinent to your organization's security. So say for instance, a user has a, a mobile device that has their personal Word application on it, uh, their personal OneDrive, their personal 365 suite, so to speak. But in addition to that, they also have access to their corporate account, uh, their corporate Word, their corporate OneDrive. Well, Intune is able to delineate between the two and determine which of the applications needs to be secured. You can then drill even further down and say, hey, I don't want anyone to be able to copy, cut, paste information from my corporate apps into any other applications that are not managed by my corporation. So lots of security tools there. Uh, and yeah. that's another topic we can go on for days about. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah, I will say Microsoft has definitely stepped up its game and in, um, in security over, you know, over uh, time, uh, you know, a hundred fold for sure. And mm -hmm. um and that data loss prevention using Intune. Intune has, what was it called before it was Intune? Um, I believe it was like mobile managed, uh, 
I don't want to. I don't want to mess this up again. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm good. horrible with acronyms. Yeah. yeah, but basically, it's um, it really has, and that product has uh, really, uh, from a standpoint, you know, again, we're thinking about people working from home, and it's not just on your uh, your tablet. Uh, it's it drives down to application level, like you said, that is uh, is huge because of uh, that and as well as knowing if a device is encrypted and providing the encryption for it and uh, setting up rules to say if this device is not encrypted you can install the application on it so just really a lot of uh, of very powerful 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 things that in my way of thinking they're so powerful that it's difficult for the end user to manage and i have dealt with some end users uh just really over the past couple of weeks dealing with some business uh email compromise and had they had that multi-factor turn on uh they would have uh, probably saved themselves a lot of grief and um so um you know they're trying and really a, a lot of times people, they won't even turn it on because they don't want to deal with, with it. So those are things that are, uh, are huge as you know, that we want to keep uh, at the forefront of, of technology. I believe the statistic is one in five businesses have a breach every year and that's 20%. So if you guys think you're going to be in business for the next you know, five years, uh, statistically, your chances are pretty high of having some incident happen. <clears throat> So true. And to go along with the statistic, Phil, uh, Microsoft actually released a statistic of their own uh, earlier this year at a RSA conference uh, where they stated 99.9% of Microsoft accounts that were breached could have been, or 99.9% .9 of Microsoft account breaches could have been prevented had those accounts had MFA uh, yeah. enabled on them. So uh, that's not to say that MFA would have absolutely protected them, but rather that MFA or having MFA in place makes it that much more difficult uh, for bad actors to compromise the account. It adds more layers uh, to the uh, walls that the bad actor needs to go through such that they then run out of resources or find it uh, less fruitful to try to breach that account and then move on to another less uh, protected account, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, a really a, a big conversation, but MFA is multi-factor authentication, and we see it used mm -hmm. a lot more. Everyone's been exposed to it, and it can be uh, delivered in a multiple way. It could be that they send a text that you have to enter in is how maybe your bank is doing it now, or maybe it's an application on your phone that mm -hmm. you touch. And it's gotten to where it's really pretty... Um, you know, pretty easy to administer. And I would highly recommend if you're running Microsoft Office 365 that you have that turned on. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, so that's something that if there's anything else that you guys uh, have taken away from this is get multi-factor authentication turned on uh, for sure for you guys that are running it. All right, I want to do a quick poll, a last poll. And this has to do with... Um, I want to see how many people are using uh, these particular products. Teams, OneDrive, SharePoint, are they not using any? Um, I want to just kind of get a feel for uh, I'm most, uh, yeah, thinking about, you know, the, the Teams and SharePoint kind of a, a thing because I, I feel like as a business owner and an entrepreneur that people – are not using Teams and they're not using SharePoint to maximize uh, the company's capabilities. And yeah, uh, that's kind of what I'm seeing here. Got some folks not voting, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and end it just to kind of give us, this is what I would expect uh, from what I'm seeing there. Let me share the results. Uh, very few people are using Teams or SharePoint. A few are using OneDrive, and a lot of people aren't using any of these products. And you know, just as a rule, SharePoint more on collabor. I mean, excuse me, Teams more on collaboration. OneDrive more on really I call data security, data backup, um, and collaboration too. 
And then of course, SharePoint being to me the big enchilada, if you're really gonna be able to be effective and efficient within your organization, you're gonna need to uh, incorporate some standard uh, kind of features and functions in a format that can be trained and digested easily. And you get the, the benefits of the, of the security standpoint of data loss prevention. So, okay, cool. Uh, so I'll go there to here and, you know, talk about, you know, I always have a slide like this in any presentation I do because I feel like our time is so valuable. It is really the uh, only unrenewable asset uh, that we have, a resource that we have. And so I want to give you the opportunities to do some things uh, in order to do this. Uh, you know, one of the things that we will offer for anybody on the call today is going to be what we call a free cybersecurity starter pack. And it's going to include a network vulnerability scan. We're going to look at your backup disaster recovery plan, look at uh, and even build out a, a quick technology roadmap for you. And also, uh, one of the big things that is missing from most organizations. And as a, a certified information system security professional, I am used from time to time in court cases as it relates to cybersecurity incidents and breaches. And one of the things, I'll use the two words that I hear all the time, uh, you are required as a business owner to have done your due diligence as it relates to protecting your employees and your clients data and you are responsible for doing due care or, or performing due care. One is, is that you're looking at it, and then the other is, is that you're doing it. And these governance documents that I have really go a very long way that I will work with you on to help you build out, some of which your staff need to, uh, to sign, <clears throat> because again, you wanna be able to say, yeah, we take this stuff really serious and let me prove it to you. Uh, and uh, also a uh, report uh, with your employee test scores, because we're gonna run your, all your employees to do a, uh, a quick, you know, like a phishing scam, scan, you know, like a artificial or a, um, a uh, simulated phishing attack. And we're gonna see how they respond. We're also gonna do a dark web scan on your company. And we're gonna see how much of their data is out on the wild. So you can kind of look and see your high risk employees uh, which is important to, to know that. Also going to give you a copy of my book and, um, you know, we're going to do that network evaluation, dark web scan, and employee training. That's really normally, I mean, really it's a lot of work that goes into that, but um, I think it's important for business owners and I want to give that away. It's normally, you know, that'd be twelve, fifteen, two thousand dollars for some companies because it takes me 15, 20 hours to perform all of this and build this reporting out for you. No obligation. And it's for anybody who is on this call. And all they have to do is fill out the survey. And we're also going to uh, allow you to win a $50 gift card to a restaurant of your choosing. All that's free, free, free. And um, all you have to do is go to www.askbis.com slash event dash survey. You can fill that out and uh, be happy to help. Uh, any questions or anything, Christy, that we have that we wanna try to address yeah. here in our last uh, few minutes? So we had a few come in, but before I get started on those, one last thing on that survey, um, it should also pop up as soon as this webinar is over, it should send you to the survey link to go ahead and take it. So we'd really appreciate that. Okay, so a question we had come in is, I see very few options to work with Google Drive content. Is that on purpose by Microsoft or is there some kind of method to do so? I'm going to let you take that one because I really, I don't know. I'll... Yeah, yeah. So um, I, what I'd really be curious to know, um, Chris, is uh, what sort of integration with Google Drive were you looking to accomplish? Because uh, there are forms of integration as far as management of user identities uh, through Azure single sign-on. Uh, you're able to uh, add the Google Cloud or G Suite uh, platform to your single sign-on apps uh, through the enterprise application section of your Azure Active Directory. And in so doing, uh, you're then able to uh, 
uh, have Azure AD be the sort of single source in terms of allowing access to your G Suite applications, your Google Drive. So when users go to sign in to one of those G Suite applications, uh, they are then rerouted through Azure AD. And then you can have the security measures that you've implemented within Azure AD uh, further protect your G Suite applications. So there's integration in that sense. There's also integration uh, as far as data governance is concerned through Cloud App Security. Uh, so that's Microsoft Cloud App Security, uh, also known as Cloud App Security Broker. Uh, so you can use or you can leverage that to govern uh, the data that resides within Google Drive. Uh, so again, I, I would be curious to know exactly what you mean by uh, options to work with Google Drive content. Yeah. Um, here's what I you just say. said. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, yeah, no, no. Chris just responded and he said accessing documents from Google Drive within Excel. Mm, okay, so accessing documents within Google Drive from Excel uh, beyond just, yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, you would need some sort of third party integration in that sense if, uh, if you're looking to make that a more seamless process. Uh, and as far as whether or not Microsoft is doing it on purpose, uh, I can't say for certain, but uh, considering OneDrive is uh, pretty much built into uh, all of their products, whether it be Windows 10 or uh, just by having an O365 subscription, uh, I think Microsoft's standpoint is if it's so easy to do with OneDrive, you know, who's really going to do it with G Drive? But I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, and yeah, yeah, there's there are certainly limitations in that regard. Yeah, I'll make a couple of um, comments to that too. As a rule, I have seen all of the all of the tech companies get a little more friendly over time. Mm -hmm. But you know, as far as you know, you, you know, I'll use um, you know, like uh, what is the Apple Music platform that now you can run on a on a uh, an Android. Uh, so I think overall they are getting better and. You know, you'd use some acronyms and uh, that I want to be sure I clean up here with, uh, you know, use Azure AD and that's really Active Directory. And that is um, it's a very powerful tool that uh, that allows you to set policies on for computers. It's called, it stands for Active Directory. It's when you log into your computer and it sounds like that's actually enhancing the security of a Google Drive uh, in, you know, with their they kind of built that in so but i could i could see them you know making it a little easier but they're probably not going to spend a lot of resources to try to you know i want to make sure that you know google uh drive works with you know seamlessly within our organization great yeah so okay i don't know if i helped or hurt on that <clears throat> any other questions christy yep so what's the difference between office suite and microsoft 365 yeah, great question there. Um, Phil, did you want me to try first and then? Oh, you're going to do much better than I on that. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Uh, yeah, so the biggest difference, and really Microsoft has made this harder to uh, differentiate with the recent name changes to some of their Office 365 products. Uh, but I'd say the biggest difference really comes down to looking at Office 365 as your productivity suite with some security measures built into it. Whereas Microsoft 365 is your all encompassing productivity, security and operating system suite or bundle rather. So what Microsoft has done with the Microsoft 365 enterprise products, including business premium and also Microsoft 365 uh, F1 and F3 licensing is to say, all right, here are your productivity uh, items, your Word, your Excel, your OneDrive, uh, your SharePoint, your Exchange Online, things like that. Here are your security items under the Enterprise Mobility and Security umbrella. So that's your uh, Microsoft Cloud App Security, your Azure AD, Active Directory, Premium P1 or P2, depending on the tier of licensing you go up to, which then enables things like uh, conditional access policies, uh, self-service password reset with synchronization of your passwords that exist in the cloud to your on-prem environment for those who are running hybrid Azure, I'm sorry, hybrid Active Directory environments. Uh, things like Azure AD Identity Protection, which actually 
uh, scans the dark web for any leaked or compromised user identities that exist in your environment. And then from there, uh, intelligently determines if your users need to go through a password reset or perhaps a multi-factor authentication challenge during their next sign-in based on what's discovered from there. And then in addition to having all those items from the Enterprise Mobility and Security Suite, you also have your Windows 10 licensing. Now, again, depending on the tier of licensing you have for Microsoft 365, that can go from Windows 10 bit, um, I'm sorry, Windows 10 Professional to Windows 10 uh, Enterprise or E3, and then the top tier enterprise license for Windows 10 being Windows 10 E5, uh, which then gets you things like Microsoft Defender Advanced Threat Protection as your endpoint protection for your devices. So you get all of those items under the Microsoft 365 umbrella. And then again, Office 365 is more focused on just like your productivity items. Yeah, and that's, um, and I think I'll sum that up with um, the Microsoft 365 suite is enormous and it is absolutely uh, whenever you start to look at the value that's in it and again you got to pick what's which products make sense to your company and that's mm -hmm. what we do we help companies with that uh yeah. but you're they are they are again they're be going from an 800 pound gorilla to a 1200 pound gorilla and the benefit to the to the world and to our to the business environment is the fact that they're able to bundle these and they're able to seamlessly make them work together and they're able to do it at a price where you would never ever ever be able to have all of that power uh from from multiple organizations True. and I think that's uh, you know that's the reason why we're seeing the migration to this to this environment um I want to ask you a question because uh, it's something that I've really uh, I've had people ask me. You know, they're moving more towards that month-to-month -month model. Have you seen any indicators uh, with the, when that date will happen? I feel like it's going to happen. Like when it, when the professional licensing will no longer be, be available and you have to go with the month-to-month -month model. Is yes. that what you're asking? Yeah. No, I have not seen a date as to when that will happen. There have been rumors. I mean, really, it was supposed to. 2019 was supposed to be the last one, uh, but uh, unfortunately, Microsoft has not come out with a official, official timeline on when that's going to occur. And knowing Microsoft, uh, when they do set deadlines for future cancellations or uh, deprecation, no yeah. it will end up getting extended by a couple years from there. So <laughs> yeah. you'll, you'll have I plenty know. of time to plan. This is anecdotal, but there was a client that we had that was running Microsoft uh, Access. And mm -hmm. you know you can buy Access as a perpetual license, meaning you buy it one time and you put it on the machine. And then you can also buy it in the subscription model through Microsoft 365. And mm -hmm. there was a bug that we determined. And the reason we determined how we found it uh, was that uh, in their, um, facility up north they had they were running microsoft 365 and there was no bug and mm -hmm. here they had bought the perpetual license same version access 2019 and we finally tracked down with microsoft and they said yeah that's a bug it's a known bug we know about it we fixed it in office 365 uh access so we said okay cool when are you going to fix it in this version they said we're not yeah that is definitely something to consider uh, and going along that line, the Office 365 suite does receive updates faster and more frequently than the perpetual licensing. So that is definitely something to consider as well. And really the way uh, future updates go with the, um, with the perpetual licensing is that uh, I believe you don't get future updates or at least you don't get future updates beyond the year in which that license is meant for. Uh, so beyond 2019, you're not going to get feature updates. Whereas with Office 365, that's meant to be the one that continually gets feature updates uh, throughout its, uh, its rather throughout your subscription of the products. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, a lot of information, guys. But uh, we're always here to help. You know, we can we can answer any other you know big questions you know that you guys have or anything that we need to take offline. Um, anything else, Christy? 
Yes, yeah, so we had someone ask, will the slideshow be made available for us to share with colleagues? Absolutely. So after the presentation, um, probably tomorrow morning, you'll receive an email that has will send you to get a recording and you can download the slides in a PDF. So yes. Yeah, we always want to be a giver. And again, I mean, um, you know, any way we can help you guys, we're here, we'll uh, answer questions. And, you know, again, that that uh, security starter pack thing that we talked about is really huge. I encourage people. One thing that wasn't in there that I do do that wasn't mentioned in there is I review your cyber liability insurance policy. And I'm telling you, I bet out of 100 clients I've met over the past year and a half, uh, maybe five of them had a cyber liability insurance policy. And another one I think I used earlier, if you remember one thing is to turn on multi-factor authentication. Uh, the second one is, is to get yourself a uh, cyber liability insurance policy and I can help you with that. It is so important because your regular uh, errors in omission or your regular professional liability will not cover you for most of the threats that are out there today. And you don't wanna find out whenever it's too late. Sure, Drew and I will second that. Ransomware is uh, rampant and on the rise. So uh, I encourage everyone who is in a position to uh, do so to definitely get that cyber uh, cyber uh, security liability insurance. And I actually went through the, the deal and and am pretty versed on the product. And whereas most of the local uh, insurance guys, you start talking to them about it, even the policy that I originally had, it was it was terrible and uh so that's something that i'll happily look at for you guys because that's something at the end of the day you know you if all things are are broken and busted at least you want to have a good policy that will cover your expenses to recover as well as your outage uh and any uh, liabilities that may be incurred from uh data loss you want to have there's there's about 12 or 13 different areas of coverage that you need to have in place and I'll be happy to discuss that with you. Beautiful. All right. Is that it, Christy? That's all. Well, guys, we are finishing two minutes early. I so much appreciate our guest. Um, and That's uh, been a pleasure. Yeah, you did a great job, man. And I'm, I'm glad to have you on our team as far as uh, to support our team. You guys have done phenomenal for us. And I just want to thank you and and uh, you know, extend that and Christy for putting all this on and your staff and all the people. Uh, we appreciate your attention to, uh, you know, to help and you know, make your business uh, more effective, more efficient, as well as more secure. So thank y'all and we'll end that here and uh, we will talk to you guys soon. Wonderful. Thanks again, Phil. Thanks again, Christy. Take care. All right, good day. Bye-bye.